in today's installment of Unpacked. He was just perfect. He was too perfect. And he beat me up. He broke a glass on my head. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Did you at any point get a protection order against him? That was like, okay, we are, de we are dealing with a dangerous person here. What is life like when you are married to a murderer? What is life like when the murderer takes the life of someone that you love? Today's guest is here to share her story. Let's unpack. Lakim Tembu is a KZN-born model and mother of one. In 2014, she thought that she had met her Prince Charming, but soon learned that what glitters is not always gold when the man she loved turned out to be a monster and she was made to run for her life. She survived the whole ordeal and is here to share her story. This is part one of the conversation. Let's unpack. Lucky, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Take me back to when you met your then husband. Oh, and you guys were just now, when did the love whirlwind begin? T take okay. me back to that time. Ex-fiance. Ex-fiance, <laughs> yes. Um, sure. Okay, so initially it was supposed to be a business you know, relationship, right? So I'll just take you back to how it got to a point where it became a relationship. Um, we, he, when I was still in varsity, like he would pop up in on my Facebook inbox and he would ask me if I would please come and be a secretary. So he had businesses, he was an entrepreneur. And I was so busy at the time. I, I mean, my modeling career was literally on its peak. I was mm. doing so many things. I was the face of a very popular face cream. Mm. And I was just doing too, like, too many things at the time for me to have a nine to five. Mm. And I also had school to focus on, varsity to focus on, mm. and I had a scholarship. So I didn't really need a job. I had a 100% scholarship. So I didn't need a job mm. also. And for three years straight, he would disappear, pop up, disappear, pop up. And then I, <laughs> and then I got to school in, right? And I moved to Joburg for a year. Mm. And Joburg for me was hell to the point mm. that I just fell into a depression and I had to go back home. Why, why was it hell? You, child. Mm. <laughs> so being a small town girl, so I'm mm. from Peter, I, I grew up in Hammersdale, as a Peter Maritzburg. Mm. And those are very small cities, mm. small towns, you know. I was not used to the fast life that Johannesburg had to offer. I mean, if you're coming to, to Johannesburg, you need to know why you're here. Yeah. And I guess I just wasn't focused enough and I didn't know who I was. So mm. I was easily swayed in every mm. direction. And naturally that came with it. Uguzi, I would find myself doing Izindo that, mm. you know, you know, they sent me deep into into things that involve shame. And I was just not happy. Mm. I was just mm. not happy. It was too fast for me. And I decided that, okay, the only thing that I feel like will heal me at this point is if I just go back home. Mm. So I'll go back home. I get, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I got admitted into a psychiatric clinic because mm. that's how deep it was. And while I was there, I thought to myself, no, man, um, I need to do something with my life. Um, I've always been, from a very young age, a big dreamer. I mean, I, I got to the point that I was in modeling, being a small town girl, because I had those types of mm. dreams. You know, being a former Miss South Africa first princess, uh, Miss South Africa teen first princess. Mm. I, I thought, no, it, it can't end here. Mm. So I decided to start a, a hair business at the mm. time, like the like in well as I sang into you know into the into the scene. And I thought to myself, this looks like something lucrative and something that will grow as a mm. time. And it's, that's exactly what's happened if we mm. look at the hair business right now. So I decided to start this hair business. And I started posting about it on, on my Facebook. And then, guess who sees mm. the guy? 
And he approaches me and he's like, oh, I'm also interested in hair. So I would please like to invest. Mm. So that's how now he grabbed my attention. And who would say no to investment? Mm. Like I'm, I'm trying, I'm a young business woman. I'm a, I'm a young entrepreneur who's literally trying to get their life back together after the trauma that, that mm. Johannesburg brought. So I, I meet up with him. And Mangabeslangana, it really was, you know, business. Mm. It was business. It was, I was focused. This is what I'm wanting to do. And in the process of that, this is now something that came way after the fact. Mm. In the process of that, weighing funda, like trying to mm. figure out what I like, the type of person that I am. Mm. And he became that. Mm. So he mirrored me. Mm. He he literally took on the characteristics of the type of man that I want. Mm. So I fell for him based on that. Because mm. Naiwa Shela. So he became that so that he can ask me out and that I fall for him. Mm. So that is how the relationship basically started. Mm. Mm. So mm. when did things start to become serious? Um, things became serious very quickly. Mm. Like extremely, extremely quickly because even Uglobola was a was a lobole kaya. I think um, I would say four or five months after we had confirmed it, okay, like this We're is dating. a serious relationship. Yeah. PR. So yeah, it, it became serious very quickly. And again, that is another technique. So I after, after a while, I figured out what he's a narcissist, mm. right? So after a while, Ngabono would say, oh, okay, cool. After figuring out what he's a narcissist, I realized what he, he fast-tracked everything for me mm. to not figure out who he is mm. so that I literally find myself at a point where I'm trauma-bonded and it's hard to get out of the relationship when his mm. narcissist slips and he becomes who he really is and not mm. who he pretended to be in order for him to fall for him. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I mean, you're using terms like trauma bonds mm. and the mask just so that everybody's of an understanding of what it is that you're talking about. And obviously the term of being a narcissist, mm. we, we like to, you know, throw it around, not really mm. understanding what it means. What is your understanding of what a narcissist is? Okay, so you are absolutely right. I mean, it's very easy for us to throw the word around, Jay, like, mm. and call people narcissists willy-nilly. Gandhi, narcissism is a very, um, it's a very serious condition. It's a personality disorder that where a person is, is very, he's not, the person is, where a person is not empathetic. Yeah. Um, they have a very elevated sense of self. They are very grandiose. And there are different types of narcissists. But I think the overlying um, or overarching idea of what a narcissist is, is a person who is, who's overly, um, who's overly, who has an, an elevated sense of self mm -hmm. to the point that, they, they don't care about everyone else that's around mm. them. So everything that they do, it's so that they can garner something from that mm. situation or from a person or whatever it is, but they never do things genuinely, mm. Mm. right? So, And I think it's important that we explaining this, you know, obviously you, you are not an expert at this particular I'm subject, not. I'm not. but we're explaining this in the context of what your experience was with this person, with this person. and the hindsight of being like, oh, that's what was happening to me at that time. I mean, yeah, of course. I mean, I think when, if, if you get to a point where you have to go and Google actions of a person mm. Mm. and narcissism comes up that's that's when i realized that it's a thing it's a personality mm. disorder and it's it's actually it's quite a popular thing in Zagalayan society it's just that people aren't really aware of it and mm. the implications that it has so that's why i even like i really sat down and, and i really had to study the subject mm. of narcissism because i had to understand what happened to me because mm. of I mean, as the victim of a person who's been in that type of relationship, you leave the relationship broken. You, mm. you, 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 you lose a sense of self. But before we get to mm. you know, you reaching that point, yeah. take us back to now. You say this person has now 
fast, everything is moving fast. Yeah. And I'm assuming in that time, they are the perfect man to you. Child, <laughs> I am are, telling what you. What were some of the things that he would do that were just over the top amazing? Um, he was just the perfect man. Something that is completely out of this world, something that's almost too good to be true. Mm. And I think it's the first time where that saying really rang true. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. Because, you know, he he was just perfect. He was too perfect. Mm. Um things that he had mirrored and figured out once mm. again. He was loving, he was supportive. He was just everything mm. I've ever he was a prince charming. Like you know, manga I'm a I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fairy tales, mm. like I'm a cartoons. He was literally the epitome of mm. what a prince charming is. Mm. But that's obviously on purpose because yeah. he's trying to get me to fall for him. Yeah. So the words he would use, um, you know, he wants to spend the rest of my, his life with me. He, like, you know, because also I, I wanted to belong. Mm. But I'll, I'll explain why later mm. on. I wanted to belong. So he figured all of that out. Mm. And I'm an empath. I'm the type of person, and... Mm. I want to be accepted. I wanted to be accepted mm. by something that is outside of me because mm. I lacked self-esteem. Mm. I lacked self-love, even though at face value, being mm. tired, but subconsciously, no, mm. based on how everything manifested itself. I mean, we went to, he was, he wanted, he said to me, he'll be the perfect uh, husband and business partner, you know. We went to uh, Dubai and we were on our way to China to look at hair at the factories, you know. Mm. So he was just perfect. He mm. was perfect. Mm. He was just that supportive. The perfect cheerleader. Everything. Perfect, yeah. Everything. Everything that uh, any woman would ever ask for. So. so now, what was the first moment or the first memory that you have of him not being Mr. Perfect, like where you're like, who is this? Okay, so this was in hindsight later on. Yeah. Because I get it. If, so the reason why these people, uh, the Amma narcissists approach you, it's because bad boy know you lack boundaries. They don't yeah. just approach anyone. Yeah. But once you lack boundaries, bad boy knows there's a level of brokenness and you are this person who's always trying to bend backwards, trying to fix a band or mm. fix situations. You're just a peacemaker. So that's the type of person I was. And I think the moment I should have realized, but I mm. didn't, that I should have realized was um, a month before he came as a lobol, mm. which was in May of 20, 2014, where we drove to Joburg because he had to come purchase a machine um, for one of his toilet paper manufacturing plants. And he assumed, Uguzi, I was busy speaking to um, a guy mm in a very flirtatious way, mm. right? Meanwhile, it's a friend. So that's when I realized, oh, okay, this guy, he's possessive, mm. right? So he, now I'm not allowed to have guy friends. Mm. So what happened when he saw, Uguzi, I'm speaking to this guy because he was also threatened by it because this guy had money, you know, he was just threatened by mm. Uguzi, these other men speaking to me, uh, regardless of whether they were there before mm. um, he came along. So he kicked me out of the hotel that we were staying in. We were staying in Monte Casino. And he kicked me out at, I think it was like 1 a.m. Mm. He kicked me out of the hotel. And that was that. He said, I must figure out Like mm. We drove from Durban. Together. Together. Mm. And then he decides to kick me out of the hotel in a place in Israel. That, for me, should have been when the penny dropped, mm. but it didn't. Instead, I, 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 I apologized on his behalf and somehow he made it seem like it's my fault that yeah. he acted the way that he did. So, Did you have to find your way back home or it was getting resolved uh, oh no. in that moment? So he came to find me 
um, at because I went and I chill. So another friend of mine was was with us. So he kicked both of us out. Imagine it was such a weird situation mm. but he kicked both of us out and we decided to go and wait until morning mm. he came looking for us and he found us and he said it's fine we can sleep in the car <laughs> right <laughs> so this is her and i walking back now to sleep in the car and then in the morning um we went into the hotel room we went back to the hotel room and I realized I could see there was someone that was there, another female. So someone else had come into the hotel room while Tina, we were sleeping yeah. in the car. So for me, that should have been a clear the, sign. I'm yeah. done. Because I mean, it was early enough. It was, I could have gotten out before even mm. but I didn't. So we drove back to Joburg. And when we drove back, um, the, the night we, we drove back, the next morning I had a shoot mm. in Durban and he beat me up. He broke a glass on my head and I went to the shoot with, you know, strangle marks and like kipopo, like kipipongs. That should have literally been a, okay. Was that the I'm first done. time he it laid hands on It was the first time yeah. he had laid hands on me. But before that... And what was his reason? Because I'm a... Mm. Why am I speaking to other men when I have someone that's coming to lobola me? Mm. So that so the possessiveness was trying was um so the possessiveness was starting to show its horns in a very hectic way. Mm. Um, the abuse, the physical abuse, was starting mm. to show its horns, and of course there was emotional abuse before that mm. that I didn't see as emotional mm. abuse, but. In hindsight, again, when I stepped, when I took a step back and I just trekked back to everything, I realized I would say, oh, snap, this literally started from day one, from mm. week one, mm. even. It's just that, you know, because I'm a narcissist, what they do is they, they, they keep pushing the boundaries. So they, they, they do this, like a, they do something in line and then they realize, oh, oh, I can overstep this boundary. And then onto the next mm. thing. I can overstep this one onto the next mm. thing. So. But what I, what I mm. want us to be clear with, especially yeah. in terms of language, yeah. is um, much as you're saying, because narcissists do X, Y, and Z, he mm -hmm. was actually an abuser. He was very you abusive. Know, so yes. so um, I don't want um, a, a person watching to think, oh, the person I'm with is just a narcissist, whereas mm -mm. we need to call, no, call it what it is. Like, they are an abuser. He was manipulating yeah. you. He was, you know, creating a situation where you now, it, it, it makes it difficult for you to leave as well. So you were mm. saying he had he had beat you up when you guys got back. You went to a shoot. Yeah, basically so the bruised and everything. Shoot. Yes. Did anybody offer you help? They asked me what happened. And again, yeah. I created a story. Yeah. I get it. That's what happens because, again, I'm trauma bonded. So trauma, being trauma bonded is when um, an abuser and a manipulator is very loving one day and mm. the, the worst monster you've ever come across the next day, loving, you know, there's, mm. there's this up and down. So your okayedness depends on them. Mm. So they, they will abuse they'll do something abusive that makes you feel like, you're okay, I need to move away from this. apologize, And you get drawn towards them again. Mm. It's just this constant up and down that mm. literally over time affects your psyche and everything starts revolving around this person. You being okay starts revolving around this person because they are literally the creator of your problems and the solver of your yeah. problems at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So um, you created a story, you found yourself protecting him. Mm. Was there ever a point in those early days where you're like, I need to get out of here? <sighs> no, to be honest, no. Why was that? Because I was operating in a place of brokenness. So I wanted to be validated, yeah. but I wasn't aware that... I'm, st I'm, I'm remaining in this abusive situation or in this abusive relationship because my validation exists outside of myself. So I lacked a lot of self-love, mm. which is weird because I, I grew up in an environment that 
where self-love was something that was advocated for. Mm. So it didn't make sense for me later on, but why did I allow such treatment to happen to me? So I think because I didn't see myself properly, mm. I stayed in that situation. Mm. So did things start to escalate and become worse and worse and worse from mm. that point? Of course they did, of course. What, like was, said, what is one of the, the most difficult um, experiences that you had? There's a couple. Mm. There's a lot. What's a standout one? I think the one that stands out the most, two actually, mm. that stand out the most for me was when he landed me in hospital and broke my ankle. Um, and I was almost amputated. And they told me, Wuti, I might never be able to walk normally again. Mm. Because for me, that was like, okay, well, then what to my modeling career, right? Mm. Because mm. that's how I get my money. You know, that's that's how current at the time I was able to earn a living. So now I can't do that. So mm, being a model was almost like a part of who I am. Mm. So now you are take, you've already taken away so much of me. And now you're taking out this, like mm. this thing that I feel like is something attached to my identity. That same night when he broke my ankle because I banned him from coming to see me as Belela, so they literally would block him because I mm. told them what happened. My, when my parents came to see me the next day, my mom told me that her car burned, that it was burned mm. the, that, that same night. So for me, that was like, okay, we are, de we are dealing with a dangerous person here. Yeah, this can't all be a coincidence. So he burnt your mother's car? Of course he did. Wow. Yeah. All because he was not given access to you at yes. the hospital. Yeah, I can imagine suddenly I have boundaries. Yeah. And where do I get off having boundaries? How because, dare you? Yeah, like yeah. how dare I have boundaries? Because that's the whole point. I can't, he can't control me anymore mm. without, um, he can't control me anymore if Ngumundo said I'm a boundaries. Mm. So what the hell, you know? And then two months after that... Um, can, can I just, be, before you get to two months after mm -hmm. that, so I understand, he had beaten you to a point that he, he broke your ankle. Yeah. How did he break it? Oh, Abudi was choke slamming my whole life. <laughs> it yeah. was wrestling. It was wrestling. So uh, we were arguing about my money. Yeah. Right. So he, he, he was saying to me, Uguti, I needed to give him Imaliami that I earned from modeling. And I said to him, first of all, you said to me, you're not going to pay for my varsity fees. At the time I was doing my master's degree. You said you're not going to pay for my varsity fees. So I'm using Limali Lena to pay for my varsity fees, you know. And, you know, he was just against anything that advanced, that advanced mm. my, my, my career, that advanced me as a person mm. and grew me as a person. So because I wasn't budging and I, because for me, that was, the, that was the final straw. I was like, no, you've done everything to break me. I will not allow you to now abuse me financially as mm. well. So that was the argument. That, that's what the whole argument was about. So he decided to choke slam me and it was it happened very quickly mm. when I, I, when I broke he, so he choke slam me in the kitchen door on our way out. Go bangang it's again. Well, we done. It's fine. Take me back home. I'm mm. good. Mm. And he choke slams me, and he like says that wrestling. Like it was crazy. It was so crazy. And as I'm lying there on the floor, I feel oh, to know, man. I'm facing up. Why do my toes feel cold? Mm. And when I look down, like my foot was <gasps> like mm. this way, and. I begged him to please take me to hospital. And he said, no, he's not going to do that. I had to make him believe that we are going to fix things. We're going to sort things out. And I tricked him into taking me to hospital. Mm. So we get to hospital. Okay, cool. Um, we lie, obviously. I get it. He's telling them I fell down the stairs and whatever. And I was like, this guy doesn't know me. So... Wahamba, then I then told the doctor afterwards what actually happened. That's why he got banned from coming in. 
Did you at any point get a protection order against him? Oh, yes. I got five protection orders Mm. against him before the final one was approved. So the reason why it ended up being five protection orders was because... So he knew how to evade the system. Mm. So with a protection order, what happens is the, the, the respondent has to sign and that they received, that they received mm. it and come to court mm. and defend why this protection order can't be granted, which, which is very, I think is doesn't make sense. Ridiculous, yeah. you know, because why must you consent to me saying stay away from me? You know, yes. so because he knew this fact, he wouldn't sign them, he would he wouldn't open the gate whenever the cops would come and he would send me messages that I'm not going to open the gate. I can see you sent your stupid cops here. And, and he, he was rude. He was very mm. rude. And I would show the cops um, these messages, but still nothing would be done, mm. which made me, which led me to believing, would see, no man, this guy is bribing mm. because it can't be. You, you can't tell me, Uguti, you know the address of the person and whenever I try and make sure that something is done about, you know, you guys protecting me against him, you're telling me you can't find him. How? Yeah. How? Yeah. It was just weird. It was strange. So we would go to court. I would go to court by myself, of course, because he didn't sign it. So he hasn't, um, he hasn't said he's mm. received it. And I would get tired because I would go to court, yang it, or they move it to the next month. Mm. I go to court again, they move it to the next month, and I naturally get tired. And every time I would stop going to court, he would start again with his antics. It was crazy. Mm. Like it was very crazy. And then the final one that was finally granted, um, even court said that they had to put it on record that it's the first time that they are having to grant a protection order without the respondent. Um, acknowledging that they received it and being present mm. in, in court. Because I, so I applied for it in March mm. after I started going crazy on my family now. I get it, I, I, I was hiding. I had mm. to go into hiding for four years. Mm. So I was looking over my shoulder for four years. I couldn't, I couldn't live. Mm. This is after we had broken up. I couldn't live Jeffrey. Had you had you mutually broken up or you were just done? No, he we was broke still, up. He we was still up. pursuing you. Yeah, so we had broken up, but of course, I get it. I'm not a human being. I'm his possession. Mm. So I can't decide. Who, who, who do I think I am to decide? Would see, we've broken up. He has to decide that. And also, I'm his possession. When he's done with me, then he'll be done with mm. me. So as long as he's not done... I'm his. He paid mm. Lobola. That's that's the that's the main thing he would, you know, advertise even to Amapoyisa, saying that Unko Keli Lobola, I'm his wife, this and that. You know, it was crazy. It was a lot. Mm. So um when uh so he would go crazy on my the, the time that I applied for the final protection order, he was going crazy on my family because he couldn't find me. So he was trying to get me out from whichever hole I'm mm. hiding from because he knows that I can fight him, I can face him. Mm. But as soon as you touch my loved ones, we're going to have problems, mm. right? And this was after he had sent hitmen on my mother. So my mother was murdered as well. Um, he sent hitmen on her and then later sent hitmen on me seven months later. And then... I, that's when I disappeared. And then he started attacking my family because now I was hiding. That's why I went to hide because I saw, oh, see, this guy means business. Why are you sending me hitmen? You know, you're trying to kill me. So I need to hide. I, I'm not safe. So I applied for the protection order. And it was a, it was February or March, if I'm not mistaken. And it was only granted in December. And every month I would go to court by myself. And I think the the point where it got granted was when I had to ask the judge, Uguzi, okay, but now does this make sense to you, Uguzi? Do you think I would be coming here every single month of my life if Uguzi, this is not serious for me? Because I'm not saying take him and throw him into jail. I am saying get him to stay away from me and inform his attorneys because he's, he communicates with me privately, telling mm. me, yeah, I saw them trying to bring the protection order, just leave me alone. 
And it's like, I'm guys, I'm just saying, I don't want this guy to contact me. I don't want him to come near me. He has no business coming near my family. I'm not saying throw him in court. I'm saying get him to leave me alone. Why is mm. that Why is that so difficult? Why must he approve of me saying leave me mm. alone? Which makes sense. I just want to understand the timelines because obviously... <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. So <laughs> after the hospital incident, you were like, I can't anymore. Mm. Your mom's car was burnt, right? Yes, what was the night. next big event that happened the after that? The next big event that happened after that was two months later when um, Uma was murdered. Next time on Unpacked. He was literally rubbing it in my face that your mother was killed. I realized that as women, we are alone. If this guy is not apprehended, somebody's going to die. He started stalking me. I was living with an entire murderer. The lengths that he went to shows that he's psychotic. Thank you so much for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khile Mamoja. Make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.